Chapter 27 Knights and Squires Stubb was the second mate. He was a native of Cape Cod, and hence, according to local usage, was called a Cape Cod man. A happy-go-lucky, neither craven nor valiant, taking perils as they came with an indifferent air, and while engaged in the most imminent crisis of the chase, toiling away, come and collected as a journeyman joiner engaged for the year. Good-humored, easy, and careless, he presided over his whaleboat as if the most deadly encounter were but a dinner, and his crew all invited guests. He was as particular about the comfortable arrangement of his part of the boat, as an old stage driver is about the snugness of his box. When close to the whale, in the very death lock of the fight, he handled his unpitying lance coolly and offhandedly, as a whistling tinker his hammer. He would hum over his old rigadig tunes while flank and flank with the most exasperated monster. Long usage had, for this stub, converted the jaws of death into an easy chair. What he thought of death itself, there is no telling. Whether he ever thought of it at all might be a question but if he ever did chance to cast his mind away after. A comfortable dinner no doubt like a good sailor's he took it to be a sort of call of the watch to tumble aloft and bestir themselves there about something which he would find out when he obeyed the order and not sooner would perhaps with. Other things made step such an easy-going unfearing man so cheerily trudging off with the burden of life in a world full of grave peddlers all bowed to the ground with their packs would help to bring about that almost impious good humor of his. Semicolon that thing must have been his pipe for, like his nose, his short, black little pipe was one of the regular features of his face. You would almost as soon have expected him to turn out of his bunk without his nose as without his pipe. He kept a hole row of pipes there ready loaded stuck in a rack with an easy reach of his hand and whenever he turned in he smoked them all out in succession lighting one from the other to the end of the chapter then loading them again to be in readiness. A new four, when Stubb dressed, instead of first putting his legs into his trousers, he put his pipe into his mouth. I say this continual smoking must have been one cause at least of his peculiar disposition for everyone knows that this earthly air whether ashore or afloat is terribly infected with the nameless miseries of the numberless mortals who have died exhaling it and as in time of the cholera some people go about with a camphrated handkerchief to their mouths so likewise. Against all mortal tribulations stub as tobacco smoke might have operated as a sort of disinfecting agent the third mate was Flask, a native of Tisbury, in Martha's Vineyard. A short stout ruddy young fellow very pugnacious concerning whales who somehow seemed to think that the great Leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him and therefore it was a sort of point of honor with him to destroy them whenever encountered so utterly lost was he to all sense of reverence for the many marvels of their majestic bulk and mystic ways and so dead to anything like an apprehension of any possible danger from encountering them that in his poor opinion the wondrous whale was but a species of magnified mouse or at least water rat requiring only a little circumvention and some small application of time and trouble in order to kill and boil. This ignorant, unconscious fearlessness of his made him a little waggish in the matter of whales, he followed these fish for the fun of it, and a three years voyage round Cape Horn was only a jolly joke that lasted that length of time. As a carpenter's nails are divided into wrought nails and cut nails, so mankind may be similarly divided. Little Flask was one of the wrought ones made to clinch tight and last long. They called him King Post on board of the Pequod because in form. He could be well likened to the short square timber known by that name in Arctic whalers and which by the means of many radiating side timbers inserted into it serves to brace the ship against the icy concussions of those battering seas. Now these three maids Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask, were momentous men. They it was who by universal prescription commanded three of the Pequod's boats as headsmen. In that grand order of battle in which Captain Ahab would probably marshal his forces to descend on the whales, these three headsmen were as captains of companies. Or, being armed with their long keen whaling spears, they were as a picked trio of lancers, even as the harpooners were flinners of javelins. And since in this famous fishery each mate or headsman like a gothic knight of old is always accompanied. 
by his boat steerer or harpooner who in certain conjunctures provides him with a fresh lance when the former one has been badly twisted or elbowed in the assault and moreover as there generally subsists between the two a close intimacy and friendliness it is therefore but meet that in this place we set down who the Pequot as harpooners were and to what headsmen each of them belonged first of all was Gweekig, whom Starbuck, the chief mate, had selected for his squire. But Gweekig is already known. Next was Tashko an unmixed Indian from Gayhead the most westerly promontory of Martha S. Vineyard where there still exists the last remnant of a village of red men which has long supplied the neighboring island of Nantucket with many of her most daring harpooners in the fishery, they usually go by the generic name of gay headers. Tashko S. Long lean sable hair his high cheekbones and black rounding eyes for an Indian oriental in their largeness. But Antarctic in their glittering expression all this sufficiently proclaimed him an inheritor of the unvitiated blood of those proud warrior hunters who in quest of the great New England moose had scoured bow in hand the aboriginal forests of the main but no longer snuffing in the trail of the wild beasts of the woodland, Tashko now hunted in the wake of the great whales of the sea, the unerring harpoon of the sun fitly replacing the infallible arrow of the sires. To look at the tawny brawn of his lithe snaky limbs, you would almost have credited the superstitions of some of the earlier Puritans, and half believed this wild Indian to be a son of the prince of the powers of the air. Tashko was stubbed the second mate's squire. Third among the harpooners was Dagu, a gigantic, coal black negro savage, with a lion like tread and a hasha wearest to behold. Suspended from his ears were two golden hoops, so large that the sailors called them ring bolts, and would talk of securing the top sail halyards to them. In his youth, Dagu had voluntarily shipped on board of a whaler, lying in a lonely bay on his native coast. And never having been anywhere in the world but in Africa Nantucket and the pagan harbors most frequented by whalemen and having now led for many years the bold life of the fishery in the ships of owners uncommonly heedful of what manner of men they ship Thagu retained all his barbaric virtues and erect as a giraffe moved about the decks in all the pomp of six feet five and his socks. Dot there was a corporeal humility in looking up at him and a white man standing before him seemed a white flag come to beg truce of a fortress. Curious to tell, this imperial negro, a hasha wear stagu, was the square of Little Flask, who looked like a chess man beside him. As for the residue of the Pequot's company, be it said, that at the present day not one in two of the many thousand men before the mast employed in the American whale fishery, are Americans born, though pretty nearly all the officers are. Herein it is the same with the American whale fishery as with the American army and military and merchant navies, and the engineering forces employed in the construction of the American canals and railroads. The same, I say, because in all these cases the Native American liberally provides the brains, the rest of the world as generously supplying the muscles. No small number of these whaling seamen belong to the Azores where the outward-bound Nantucket whalers frequently touch to augment their crews from the hardy peasants of those rocky shores. In like manner, the Greenland whalers sailing out of Hull or London, put in at the Shetland Islands, to receive the full complement of their crew. Upon the passage homewards, they drop them there again. How it is, there is no telling, but islanders seem to make the best whalemen. They were nearly all islanders in the Pequot, Isolatos too. I call such, not acknowledging the common continent of men, but each isolato living on a separate continent of his own. Yet now, federated along one keel, what a set these isolatos were. An anachars excludes deputation from all the isles of the sea, and all the ends of the earth, accompanying old Ahab and the Pequod to lay the world's grievances before that bar from which not very many of them ever come back. Black little Pip he never did oh, no. He went before. Poor Alabama boy. On the grim Pequot as forecastle ye shall ere long see him beating his tambourine prelusive of the eternal time when sent for to the great quarter deck on high he was bid. Strike and with angels and beat his tambourine and glory called a coward here hailed a hero there. 